Buster Keaton was a visual artist. Everything that he did was visual wit. No matter what, even in the talkies, even when the people all around him are talking reams and reams of dialogue, if you focus on Keaton, his performance is always, always rooted in his acting and his visual style. superb athlete, uh, tremendously fit, could take any kind of punishment, did his own stunts, and audiences saw that and laughed because they, the, the gags were funny. It was only later that people really began to look at the films again and see just how, you know, absurd and modern and cerebral they were. He knows how to combine his movement, his body playing against space, dimension, foreground, background, alone with people. He knows how to blend all those elements into a monumental comic image for you. He was the most cinematic of the silent uh, comedians. He really explored the entire boundaries of the medium, what it could do, and, and, and many of his movies are kind of commentaries on the sort of wonders of filmmaking itself. James Agee said he was the most wildly inventive of the silent comedians, and that was certainly true. Keaton grew up in vaudeville. Uh, he's on the stage from the age of four, you know, in his parents' traveling act. And so he was really used to making it up on the fly. The family act of the three Keatons, from what I can tell, was uh, for the most part geared around two things. One was a large table that they did acrobatic tricks off of. And the other was the fact that his mother was the first female saxophone player in the United States. So she would come out and do a musical number, and sometimes they'd be off behind her doing terrible things. I mean, the gist of it was that Buster was supposed to be this naughty child who couldn't be controlled. So the mother's out doing her saxophone number, and the father's trying to control Buster. And it was very physical. They actually sewed a suitcase handle on the back of Buster's costume so his father could grab him and throw him into the wings. He said, I learned from an early age, I was the kind of comedian who didn't get laughs if I was laughing. If he started to smile or laugh at what he was doing, the laughs started to die down. So he discovered the more serious he was, the more people laughed at him. And his father picked up on that, who has really trained him. And when, when they were roughhousing, if Buster started to smile, his dad would say under his breath, puss, 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 meaning your face, don't smile. So then when he got into movies with Fatty Arbuckles, where he broke in, who was a Senate veteran, he was forced to smile because that was the style and, and be more animated than he was comfortable with. Buster gets down to the studio. He says, the first thing I did was start tearing the camera apart, figuring out how it worked. I was, he was fascinated by the whole thing. Got into a rough house scene in a country store with Fatty Arbuckle. And, uh, and it immediately just took to it like a duck to water. He instinctively understood the camera. He understood that you needed to tone it down. You couldn't mug, and everyone around him was mugging. So immediately from his first appearance, he's already different. He doesn't have this grotesque makeup. He doesn't ham it up. He doesn't look at the camera and draw attention to himself. He just very quietly and slowly goes about his business. And that drew attention to him. You know, people were riveted watching him. When you see him in the Arbuckle films, he's a youth. He has discovered this wonderful toy. He wants to play with it, and you can see the enthusiasm. That's, in fact, where he smiled with Arbuckle. At that point, when Keaton's working with Arbuckle, you know, Arbuckle's in charge, and Buster is definitely learning, you know, at the knee of the master. And Arbuckle was a very generous 
tutor. I mean, he let Buster blossom. He didn't try to hold him back. He let him have solo pieces within the movies. Within a year or two, Buster's having his own little solo sequences. When he becomes his own artist in the, in the silent golden age of his work, you can see him not with arrogance, but with a sense of ownership. I know what I'm doing. I've learned from Arbuckle. I'm applying this through my short films. I'm experimenting. I'm coming up with very interesting techniques, very different from the other comedians around me. And now when I go into my feature films, I'm going to develop them even more. I have the luxury of time to tell a complicated story with all these great innovations that I've discovered along the way. If Keaton hadn't been a filmmaker, he always said he would have been a civil engineer. He had this kind of mind that analyzed things, and those things included the plots for his films. You know, he knew how to structure things, whether it was a gadget, because a lot of his films have these fantastic gadgets, or a gag, or a fall, or a whole film. He just had the kind of mind that knew how to put things together. He and his gag men would get together, and they'd come up with some premise, you know, a funny beginning, and then they'd come up with an ending. Does he get the girl, does he not? And then they would just leave the middle to work itself out. It's kind of like a choreographer working on stage. You can't write a dance routine. You know, you have to get it up on its feet and you have to move it around, and, and so that's, that's how these movies were created. He had this team of people, and they were like a family. You know, they worked, he had them on staff, they worked together all the time, and if he had a point where he couldn't figure out what to do next, they'd stop and play baseball for a couple of hours until he figured it out, and then he'd go, okay, got it, and they'd go back. Or somebody else would say, okay, got it, and they'd go back. Keaton developed his own gags, or if people wrote gags for him, Buster had a way to take that, twist it, and make it uniquely his own. As long as Buster Keaton was in control, he, was, he had no problems with creating the visual humor that suited his character, that, that little sad-faced man that he created. Keaton loved to work with machines and, so, oh, and nature. So a lot of the themes that you'll see are man versus machine, man versus nature, man versus man, man versus woman. But he really loved the machine most of all. And it was always the little guy against the big Goliath. Um, and usually, he somehow tamed it. He dared to stand there in the center of it and let it fall on him. He, he knew precisely, exactly, how that was going to fall and trusted his own judgment. It's, it's a classic, that, particular, that one little thing that he did. The danger element was important to him. And he also said, when asked why he didn't use stuntmen, Stunt, stuntmen don't get laughs, which I think is true. He knew how to get the laughs. Although he would never have said this, he was doing some things that were very surrealistic. Essentially, his character is isolated in a universe that sometimes doesn't make any sense. And a lot of the comedy comes out of the fact that he's just plugging away, trying to make things work. And around him is all of this chaos, all of these things that just don't work right. He wanted to explore new things with the film process and the camera. So that's why you have such interesting things from the Playhouse, where he masked up parts of the lens and you could see him nine times in the orchestra or two times in the audience or dancing with himself, you know. He did these wonderful things that very few people did as part of the story, and he wove those mechanics into the story so that it made sense. It wasn't just a gimmick for its own sake. The fascinating thing is Buster Keaton was was not a conscious artist. He never, in fact, he hated it when anybody referred to him as an artist. He just thought of himself as somebody making funny movies and gags. But there was something about, he had an uncanny ability to just feed his subconscious into the movies. Now that kind of wit you will never find in the lesser comedians. They just did not think that way. They thought in terms of gag, gag, gag. Keaton thought in terms of gag integrated into my character integrated into the story. 
because he knew that if you were going to watch him for 60, 70, 80 minutes, he'd better be a character that maybe you didn't believe in him, he was surreal, but you had to be interested in him. Natalie Talmadge had two sisters who were movie stars, huge movie stars. She was a very pretty, attractive, but shy, introverted girl who was always treated as the ugly duckling, which is really sad because she wasn't at all. But so she felt she wanted to compete with her sisters and the way she wanted to do that was materially. You know, they married when he was at the peak of his career. And um, I think that it was a tumultuous marriage, and I think both of them were living the high life. Keaton adored his children. He had two boys, Jimmy and Bobby, and you know they were, they were a big part of his life. And after they had their second son, he describes it as, you know, his wife and her mother and her sisters all tell him, great, you know, move into the extra bedroom, you're done. And he jokes, he says he, he lost his amateur standing and he was considered a pro and so he was booted out of the bed. They had very bitter fights and eventually a very public divorce and she was so angry at him because I think that Natalie felt he left her by drinking <laughs> and by running off with other women because he in turn felt alienated from her. So when she left, she took all the assets and she changed the boys' names and I think it was tremendously traumatic and, well, Buster Keaton had a complete breakdown. Everything was going right. And suddenly, in the course of about three and a half, four years, he lost his creative control, which was really devastating to him. You know, he gets signed over to MGM and he has no control. He loses his team of people. MGM, which had no experience doing comedies, none, were suddenly telling him what to do. Sound came in. His wife left him. She took the kids, renamed them. The older son had both his first and last name renamed. He was 11 years old, maybe 12. I mean, it's not like he was an infant. Buster went bankrupt. He got sued by the IRS for back taxes, and three of his best friends died. Suddenly, nothing was going right, and I don't think he had the inner resources to handle it because nothing had ever gone wrong before. So suddenly, everything's gone wrong, and he did what lots of people do. He drank. So he's in these movies he hates. He starts drinking. You know, even though he was probably drinking before that, it really put the drinking into high gear. And he, he basically destroyed his own career because then it started to appear on screen. the duel at the edge of the forest at daybreak. I come from the north, you come from the south. And come shooting because I am going to kill you. Go away, we want to be alone. Don't worry. She will be alone very soon. Oh. Martino, the police. I cannot kill you here. I will fight a duel. Duel? I meet you at daybreak. Edge of the forest. I come from the north, you come from the south. And come shooting as I'm going to kill you. When Buster Keaton came to Columbia in 1939, they paid him $1,000, twice as much as most of the other comedians, and they thought that this was great. Look at what we're doing for you. And actually, Buster needed the money. He was grateful for the money. So that is how he basically ended up at Columbia. So long, Pa. I 
I think he said work is work. I think he was very pragmatic. I got to pay the bills. He was supporting, in addition to himself, he was supporting his mother, his father, his sister, his brother, and at one time, his brother's wife and child, none of whom were working. So Buster had always felt responsible from the time he was a small child. And Papa loves you too. And you, you just be a nice little girl. And when Papa comes home, he'll bring... When Papa comes home, he'll... The Columbia shorts were made for, you know, three to five days, very little money. But all the veterans of slapstick from the 20s who had now found their form of comedy falling out of fashion as, as screwball comedies came in and dialogue comedies came in and radio comedians became really movie comedians, all these slapstick veterans, one of the last places they had to go was Columbia Studios. They're very formulaic films, much like going back to Arbuckle's films. The pure slapstick, you know, little love interest, uh, rivals, whatever going on. But you don't see the grand scale themes that Keaton loved. Jules White's philosophy of comedy was make a move so fast, the people won't care if it's not funny. And Jules's problem was that he could never discern what was tasteful, what was genuinely funny, what people would like to see, and what might just be annoying or protracted. So I think there was a clash about what was a clash of styles. Yes, they were both physical, dealing with physical comedy, but Buster's was a little more cerebral, a little more motivated, a little more brought out from the story. And I think Jules White would be happy to just have, you know, anvils fall out of the sky and hit people. And he'd have been fine with that. Buster Keaton's problem was that he did not speak up. He wanted to get along and he wanted to be a team player. And often at the expense of his own health, he would grouse and grumble and complain afterwards, usually when he was home or with his friends. That director doesn't know what he's doing. I wanted to do it this way. He made me do it that way. But on the set, Buster was as easy as a house cat. Business is picking up. Yeah. He used to be the artist with the fine paintbrush on a canvas. Now, when he's in the sound era, it's almost like they've given him a roller to paint with. <laughs> you know, he can't paint with the finesse that he used to paint. With sound, you had to add words, and those words, in Keaton's case, were probably redundant, superfluous, and not as eloquent as the gestures that he was making on screen. They want me dead. Pack everything and we'll escape out that window. Buster Keaton, even in the weakest of these shorts, or the shorts where the material is unsuited for him, is such a riveting and compelling personality, a screen presence. And he's still doing things inventively, creatively. Maybe he has to move it along because there are only 16, 17 minutes here, and he can't build a routine the way he wants to. But he is trying his darndest to make this material work. There's a moment in She's Oil Mine that is nobody else could have done this gag. There's a, a screw that needs to be screwed into something. Buster keeps his body perfectly straight. And Buster becomes like this big key to screw the thing in. And he gets turned around physically while he's holding on to the screwdriver. Now, nobody but Keaton could come up with a gag like that. It's mechanical. It's unexpected, it's smart, and it's awfully funny. In Taming the Snood, 
Keaton does the, uh, a version of the table routine, jumping up and falling off a table, which is what his father's act was in vaudeville. And he had done stuff with his father around that table, and so he recreates it in that film. So there was a lot of recycling of things that he'd done before or things that he'd done on stage, because you had to think quick in four days. So there, I think there's a lot more what people would call slapstick, a lot more physical falling down, getting hit, you know, that kind of thing than Keaton would have had in his own films in the 20s. I mean, he wasn't embarrassed to, to, to steal a bit from one of his two reelers or take something from one of the MGM movies and put it in a Columbia short. He didn't think it wrong, and, and this is also the kind of guy who would lend his gags to the Marx Brothers and Red Skelton and not get any credit. The great happy thing going on simultaneously to this for Buster Keaton was Eleanor Norris, who he met. She, he met her when she was 18. She came over to his house to learn how to play bridge because he was a famous, brilliant bridge player. One of the other players snapped at her for making a bad move, and she came back at him and said, well, didn't you ever have to learn this game? And she said Buster looked up for the first time and noticed her. When he realized that Eleanor really was interested in him. They eloped, and all of a sudden he knew happiness that he had never known before. He found joy outside of the movie business, and so it was never as critical to Buster after 1940 about whether or not he was actually creating routines or just reusing, reshuffling old routines. I think he was very content and living in his little ranch house in San Fernando Valley and traveling occasionally and doing guest appearances. I think that that was fine. I don't think he really wanted more than that. And in fact, over the next five years, he did almost no work in front of the camera, and it didn't seem to bother him in the least. He was writing gags at MGM anonymously, never getting screen credit for it. He liked doing that, and I think he had gotten to a point finally where he realized he was no longer a big star. He was very surprised at the end of his life when there was a big resurgence and he's getting these standing ovations at film festivals and people are calling him a genius. He was completely taken aback. I mean, he was pleased, but he would say that no man can be a genius in slap shoes and a flat hat. How does it feel to be a big shot, kid? Because his characters are so physically and emotionally removed from everything, and because he created this sort of slightly distorted universe, you know, where you can try really hard and it's still not gonna work, somehow that's what our universe has turned into. Because what he was seeing in human character has become more pronounced in human character since his heyday. Oh, 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 why did you shoot him? You lost the best chance you've ever had. This place in film history is one of the towering figures of the American cinema. Not just one of the greatest comedians, one of the greatest filmmakers in the American cinema. <laughs>